Dogen one time when he was talking to, or starting to talk to him, when he was talking to his monks at AHG, he said uh, something to the effect of, uh, when a senior monk speaks, uh, younger monks should be quiet and listen and uh, not offer their opinions. Th this repeatedly comes up in the practice of Zen. And uh, as I was trying to think about, okay, what am I going to talk about this Sunday? I, I came back with, Dogen talked a lot about impermanence, but we had uh, last month, nobody got to see the horrible talk I gave on impermanence, right? Because you, you threw it away. Excellent. Uh, yeah, it was very depressing. I even got depressed by the time I was done talking about impermanence. But for those that uh, were here to suffer through that, uh, I want to talk about another very common topic within the practice of the meditation school, uh, which was begun by Dogen in Japan. And, and that is this thing about opinions. This, this whole business of opinions is really interesting because within the Sangha, there's the idea of harmony. And one way to get in trouble really quick in the Sangha is to cause disharmony. And that might be speaking about somebody else, uh, uh, you know, saying that uh, they were doing bad things or, uh, you know, inappropriate things and things like that, which caused disharmony and even perhaps a schism within the Sangha. And I think it's, uh, to me, it's, it's very interesting because the humanity of the Buddha and the people that studied with him become very obvious uh, when you when you look at the idea that monks have to be told that they need to sacrifice their personal uh, opinions for the sake of the group. That flies in the very face of being an American, okay? Because uh, Americans, if nothing else, they get to have their opinions, right or wrong. They're still arguing about whether they should have the battle flag of the Confederacy, which I find interesting. A few years ago, I discovered that this flag we all think of, us that were not born in the South, uh, we think of as the Confederate flag. It's not the Confederate flag. It's the battle flag of the Confederacy. And that carries with it a, a real different flavor that flying over the capital of one of uh, the 50 states, actually many more, are, is this battle flag, this war flag of a, of a country that uh, briefly existed and then was defeated and reunited with the United States of America. Okay, And of course, those who grew up in California, like Rob and I, we, you know, we don't even understand what it's all about. You know, it's like, really? Isn't, wasn't that over with a long time ago? And now it's the University of, what is it, South Carolina is talking about moving a statue because it's too close to the main building and everybody's getting very upset about this whole thing, as if this history never happened. But in this country, we dearly cherish our ability to have opinions. And it's, it goes right in with freedom of speech and to some extent our ability to assemble, lawful assembly. And uh, so it's really, really important to us that we can have our opinions. Dogen never taught anybody that they couldn't have an opinion. None of the great masters ever taught anybody they couldn't have opinions. They taught them that they should learn how not to express their opinions. And so if we, if we look under the surface of what is this all about? Well, part of it is about, the Buddha said, if what you're going to say is going to cause disharmony within the Sangha, which was in his time a very large group, we're talking hundreds of monks that gathered around the historical Buddha, and perhaps a hundred or maybe even two hundred monks that had gathered around the senior teachers, because they all weren't in one spot. Uh, there's going to be disharmony. It's, it's the human condition. People are going to have disagreements. They're going to have disagreements about uh, everything. 
which all you have to do is just look around. You know, I, I think I took a gardening class when I moved up here, and I think it's so obvious. Uh, a lady in the class, who were well, well over 50 people in the class, and the teacher was talking about, okay, if you have this kind of soil, you should mix some sand in so the root crops will grow and not get weird looking. And uh, some lady put up her hand and said, where should I get sand? He said, hang a bucket out. And I've never forgotten that. Chuck slapped us because, yeah, hang a bucket out. And, then, you know, in a day or two, go get your sand and put it in the garden. Well, where are we going to find a group of people that disagree? Just open your eyes. Pay attention to what's going on. It's constantly happening. It, it starts in elementary school and it stays with us for the rest of our existence that we disagree about things. We disagree about what good food is. Okay? Can there be anything more subjective than food? And yet people will argue about it. They rate it. Right? I don't understand on television they have all these chef shows. I, I, I don't watch that kind of stuff. But they're, they're everywhere. And they've got the chefs that are yelling and screaming at people and threatening their jobs and throwing stuff. I see it in commercials. We've got to do this thing and pots start flying and knives are going in the walls and all this kind of stuff. But that's an exaggeration, but the reality is people argue about food. I don't get it. You eat what you like. <laughs> and you don't eat what you don't like. And I, I grew up in a household where there was a family member. He was an elderly gentleman. And uh, uh, he, uh, when we'd have a, a big family get together, they'd pass the food around, as you do. You had lots and lots of food, more than anybody could possibly eat. And something would come around, I don't know, spinach. And Danny would go, oh, I'll have some of that later. What a courteous way of saying, no, I don't want any of it, I can't stand spinach. And as a kid, I watched this year after year, and any time, and there were things he never ate. And it became obvious to me, and it was probably obvious to everybody else. But he had such a nice way of saying, no, I'll have some of that later. Now, I know there are people that would say, that's lying. So the, you know, the, the extreme, obsessive, compulsive, we always have to be truthful type of people, okay? But my mother or my grandmother would say, no, that's just not hurting anybody's feelings. That's not lying. That's just not making a ruckus. And the Buddha would say, that's a very good thing to say, even though the Buddha some instances said you should always tell the truth. But he wasn't talking about, I don't want any spinach. And what the Buddha really never said was, you should tell everybody about why you don't want any spinach. Okay. Which goes on and on and on. And I won't, uh, I won't bore you with my soliloquy on boiled uh, okra, which is not one of my favorite things. And at the age of 12, I had a great gelatinous mass in the middle of my dinner plate in Montana at my grandfather's house. I won't tell you what my reaction to that was. I did eat it all, though, because that was the rules of the family. It didn't matter whether you liked it. If it was on your plate, you ate it. I do know that I made sure that my plate was no longer available for the rest of my life for boiled okra. We, we have opinions on everything. And the more educated we are, the stronger our opinions are. And here is the paradox. Years ago, back when we first moved to the desert and we started building the Desert Zen Center, one of our folks decided to subscribe to Tricycle Magazine. So we had these monks that were getting in arguments, and they were getting in arguments just pretend there was a, you know how your TV, sometimes you lose the sound, and then it comes back. If you try to figure out what went between the two points, just do that with my talk. Um, they were arguing about what the Buddha taught. 
And that's such an extraordinary thing to argue about what the Buddha taught. Because the Buddha was right there. And I find it interesting because we get these stories related that the monks, the senior monks, were arguing about what he taught and what the meaning of his teaching was. And we know one in one particular instance, actually more than once, but in this one I'm thinking of, the Buddha left. He simply walked away. And he went up into the mountains and he lived with a group of his disciples who lived up there. It was a smaller group. But he went and he lived with them. And uh, a couple months later, he came back. And everybody's going, oh, we didn't know where you were. You know, we thought maybe you got injured, a tiger ate you, something happened horrible. And uh, here you are, and where have you been? And he said, I went to live with the monks in the mountain. And they said, why? And they said, because they get along. And I went to find out because I couldn't figure out what to do with you guys. All you want to do is argue. And so I went up there to find out what is it that they do differently than what we're doing here, where they can get along and be easy going. And what he discovered was that even though people, there, there was a group of very intelligent monks there, and they all had their opinions about things, they were willing to be quiet rather than to start an argument. Now, I use the word argument advisedly. This is not, you know, this, we're talking about emotion. Really in an argument, emotion comes up. Because if you have, you know, I hear people say, well, no, we're just discussing. Well, in a discussion, there's no emotion. In a discussion, there is. Well, you know, I heard that, and then we saw this and all of that. And it's a nice, friendly exchange of information. In an argument, people start getting mad. And their face gets red, and they start clenching their fists. And not all people do that. Some people just kind of do that and walk away. Okay? You don't have to get mad to, to end an argument. All you have to do is disagree with someone so much that you just set your set your job, turn around and walk away. And everybody knows that you disagree with what was said. Even though, and I, you know, these are the people, well, I didn't say anything. Well, no, you didn't, but you turn around and walked out of the room and never looked back. So obviously you were unhappy with what we were saying. So it comes in many forms. What what the Buddha found out is not that they had less opinion. Or they were better people. What he found out was they realized that once these arguments started, well, communication for one thing stopped. Nobody listens to somebody that's arguing with them. And nobody listens when they're arguing. And so if you're trying to convert someone, change your mind. Think about the Buddha did. He did it very quietly, and he did it very persuasively, and he never did it emotionally. It wasn't that he didn't disagree with people. The sutras are full of the Buddha correcting wrong thinking. But he never tells people they're wrong. He never says, oh, well, you're wrong. A parent does that all the time. Stop that. Well, blah, 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 the child goes, blah, 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 and the parent goes, no, you're wrong. You do it this way. Okay? Totalitarianism, of course. But we get away with it because you're children. Don't run out into the street. Well, my friends run out in the street. I told you don't run out in the street. If you run out in the street, I'll spank you. Oh, well, now we have a justification for what we're doing because children run out in the street and get run over. Some people would say, well, explain it to the child. I'm, I'm big on that. Explain it to the child. Do everything you can to explain to the child that if they run out into the street, they'll get run over by a car and then make the threat. And if you do it, I'll spank you the next time you do it. And I will introduce you to the notion of pain. So it's a complicated thing. But the Buddha never, never threatened spanking. He talked about uh, one of the things was permanence, an impermanence. He talked to the Kalamas, which was a tribe, which was a village. And he talked to them, 
he proved and then disproved all the different current thoughts about the notion of permanence and impermanence. And he did it, everyone, everything that anybody could come up with. And what he got done with is there is no, nothing that you can express that's truly going to explain the notion that all things change. And so, to me, the lesson I took out of that is just be quiet. You can say that all things change. Look around you in the world. All things change. But there, there was the notion of, uh, well, one of the things that, that I thought was interesting, they were talking about the soul. They were talking about the, the Atma, something that would continue on. And uh, they, people wanted to draw, there was a group of people at that time in India that felt that absolutely there was no soul and there was nothing that continued on. And that when you died, it was all over with. And it, this is a fairly popular belief now, that everything's done. It's called humanism. Everything's done. So you better get your shot in right now, because when, when you die, everything's done. There's nothing past it, period. Now, people think that's what Buddhists believe. Well, not really. But we also don't buy into the soul. So we make it really difficult for you to grasp what it is that we're talking about. And the Buddha said, to have an absolute idea like that, you get into trouble. And essentially what he was saying is, keep your options open, keep your mind open. You may learn something later on that will reveal to you the way things really are. But right now, you don't need to take a hard, fast view of these things. I remember he lived in, a, in an age where there wasn't, when you died, there wasn't a reward to go to. The notion of karma and rebirth is, has nothing to do with the reward system. They just thought it was a logical thing. That when you die and then you're reborn, and of course the Indians, I love the Indians because you can come back as a cockroach, or pill bug, or you know, any, any old thing, a field mouse, or you know, an, an insect that lives 24 hours. You can come back as these things. And the Buddha basically said, you, basically what he said was, you can't prove any of these things. So what are you arguing about? You, you have things you're comfortable with, and that's okay. Okay, so Tricycle Magazine did a survey. And their survey was, and I've mentioned this bunches of times because I, I found it so fascinating. Uh, their survey was looking at Zen centers. Tri Tricycle Magazine has, to me, my personal opinion of them, is they have a very limited uh, uh, audience in the sense of what they're exposed to. And they have a very limited group of people that, that are published for them. They're all on the East Coast. They're the same names recycled over and over again. <coughs> you know, they have Tibetans, they have uh, uh, people that do uh, not, not Theravadans. I've never seen anything about Thera, from Theravadans in there, but they do have people doing Vipassana meditation, but there's no monks involved. So they've got lay people doing Vipassana, and they've got uh, Mahayana monks, teachers, and they've got Tibetan teachers. And that's the sum and total of the Buddhist world to them. And so they looked at Zen, which is really important here because most Americans are Zen Buddhists. Or participate in the Zen Center. They may not be Buddhists. And they, they said the demographics of people that attend a Zen Center are people with a career who are college educated. And then, then they, they went on to say, and if they're not college educated, they're certainly well read and they're intelligent enough that college would not be a problem. Okay. Because the minute you say most of them are college educated, people go, well, you know, Joe's not college educated, and he, he has a big empire of money, and he's making lots of things, and he's influential, and he's a really nice guy, and he feeds the hungry, and he's a great musician, and blah, 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 and they just go on and on and on about this, you know, hell, okay, fine. Okay. Um, but I, I, I found it fascinating. So, we were having a retreat the next weekend, and I, I went out to the Zendo as we do, and we were doing meditation, and I kind of looked around, 
and there was a lady there that taught, I think it was at USC, and she had a doctorate in biology. She was an older lady. And, and I, I counted in there, and there were masters, and a bunch of masters, and a bunch of bachelor's degrees, and a couple people that had two-year degrees. And I think there was one person out of 20 people that didn't have a college degree of some sort. And I thought, okay. Well, you know what you get when you get a college education? You get opinions on a lot of different things. So the great master Lin Chi said one day when asked, it's much easier to teach an illiterate farmer than it is to teach a scholar. Because his opinions keep getting and so we have this, this interesting thing going on in this country, it has been going on for a hundred years, that the people that come to the practice of meditation, and come to the practice of reflection, and, and maybe read some sutras and some books on this stuff, are pretty smart people, and they're pretty educated people, and they have a hard time not letting their opinions get in their way. And I thought, uh, Thay Mudita, Thay Tom Hai, uh, he really tickled me because uh, he listened to what I said, which is a unique thing, you realize. I don't even know why there's counselors, counselors and psychologists, because anybody would tell you that nobody ever listens to them. You know, they go, I, I, I knew a lady who was incredibly overweight and had problems with her knees, so she went to a doctor, and the doctor said, you need to lose weight. We're talking about somebody 350 pounds, right? You need to lose weight, it's destroying your knees. So she came back to work where I, I worked with her and she said, that doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. The next week she went to another doctor. I'm not making this up. And the doctor told her the same thing. And she came back and she said, I don't know what it is with these guys. They're, they're obsessed with this idea that I need to lose weight. And eventually she had knee replacements and she had uh, the thing where they stapled her stomach and all of that sort of stuff. But she just wouldn't buy the idea that somebody could tell her the proper way to do things and the reality was she needed to lose weight. And I'll be honest with you, at this stage of my life, I've never known anybody that was truly overweight, obese, truly obese, that didn't have problems with their knees and back. It, it, just, it just goes with it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if you're walking around carrying 150 pounds in your arms all the time. Just imagine that. Throw 150 pounds there, and then what's going to happen to your poor old body? But she was a, she had a college degree, and she was a teacher. And so she knew better than the doctor knew, because we only had a couple of years of college. And people go to psychologists, and the psychologist says, stop doing it. And they go, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. In other words, if you tell me what I want to hear, everything's fine. If you tell me what I don't want to hear, there's a problem with you. And I just have to ask the question, why are you going? I went to my doctor, went and saw my cardiologist, and he says, why are you doing this? And I said, because this other doctor told me to do it. Yeah, well, why did he tell you to do it? I said, you know what, I don't know why he told me to do it. I got a little, little pig. So I don't know why he told me to do it. He's the doctor. You tell me to do something, I do it. He tells me to do something, I do it. Where, who am I to decide what I should be doing? I come to you guys because you're the experts. If you're wrong, you're wrong. But I'm not going to worry about it. I do what I'm told to do by the doctor when it has to deal with my health. And that's a hard thing. Americans are, are so weird. Americans believe two things. They know better than their doctors, and they know better than their teachers. Everybody's an authority on public education. Just ask anyone. We have a bunch of people with degrees in law and politics, and they're in up in Sacramento, and they're making laws about education. There ain't one teacher in the whole bunch. Same federal government even gets worse. It's very difficult not to have an opinion when you're an educator. Very, very difficult. So what do you do with it? You just set it aside. It's not about having opinions or not having opinions. It's about being able to just set it aside. And that one of the hardest things for people to accept, 
because we are coming up on the winter training. And I told Mudita when he became a monk, I said, now, your job for the next two years is to know nothing. And he got it. He got it the first time. He used to tell people, my job is not to know anything. What a great job. And he was a smart guy. He was a talented guy. And I admired him so much because, you know, that was the second time he came here to study with me. A lot of people didn't know that. That was his second time. And the second time he got it, he understood the enormous freedom of not having to tell somebody they're wrong, of just going along and taking care of himself. His meditation practice got very strong. His day-to-day -day practice of just moving around and doing things got tremendously powerful because he removed himself from arguments and discord. And so if you cause disharmony in the Sangha, it's one of the reasons you can be told to go live in the forest because you're disrupting things. It's got nothing to do with whether you're right or not. It has to do with you're simply disrupting the community. And it's hard enough to live together without someone constantly pointing out that everybody else is wrong. Which, by the way, they usually are. It's never a question of being wrong or right. You know, it's, it's much less subjective than food. I mean, this one over here, he's got more bottles of hot stuff in the refrigerator. And, you know, I can't believe it. He sits down. Who knows what he tastes? Because he's not tasting the food. He's going squirt, squirt, squirt. And then he go get, goes get another thing full of chilies and squirt, squirt, <laughs> squirt. And then he's in heaven. Okay, so food, yeah, food is terribly subjective. I'm enormously lucky. Because there's almost nothing that I dislike. And that's not because I'm an enlightened master. That's just because I've always been that way. I just like all kinds of stuff. And I feel so sorry for people that can only limit eat a limited amount of food, you know, they don't like this, and they don't like that. Wow. That's, that's got to be rough. But the question of opinions, everyone's got them. Okay? Everyone in here has got some advanced learning past high school. So that may be true. And who knows what's hiding inside his head. Okay? And so, for the sake of everybody being Tell the little girl that she looks very pretty with purple hair. And everything is just fine. 